If I ask you to think of a luxury watch brand, you're likely to say Rolex. And could that be because it was in the title of the video you just clicked on? Possibly. But it's more likely because Rolex has built a brand that's synonymous with luxury, quality, and success. The Rolex name and coronet crown represent power and prestige at events from the US Open and Wimbledon to yacht racing to Formula One racing. And they've been found on the wrists of some of the world's most influential people from Brad Pitt to Barack Obama to Martin Luther King Jr. In this video, I'm going to cover the early days of Rolex from their pioneer founders to the origin of the name. Then I'm going to cover two game-changing innovations that took Rolex to the next level. And finally, dig into their marketing strategy to find out how they become known as a symbol of prestige among watch enthusiasts and people who've never worn a watch in their lives. Going all the way back to the United Kingdom in 1905, Hans Wilsdorf and his brother-in-law Alfred Davis founded a watch company called Wilsford & Davis. The two business partners started by importing watch movements from a Swiss company called Agler. Founded by Gene Agler in 1878 and later run by his sons, they specialized in watch movements that were small enough to fit into a wristwatch, which at the time was rare because pocket watches dominated the market. Hans and Alfred would take these movements and put them inside of their own high-quality watch cases, selling them to jewelers who would often put their own branding on it, accompanied only by W and D engraved on the bottom of the watch case. Now, oddly enough, Rolex doesn't make any mention of Alfred Davis or Wilsford and Davis on their website. Maybe from a marketing standpoint, they thought it would be a more straightforward, appealing story without mentioning this, but interesting that they kept it out nonetheless. Now, it wasn't until 1908 that Wilsford and Davis registered Rolex as a trademark. The name has no meaning other than the fact that the pair thought that it was easy to say in multiple languages and would look good on the face of a watch. Around the same time, they opened up their first office in Vienna, Switzerland to be closer to Agler, who continued to make the watch movements for Rolex. Although separate companies, Rolex and Agler became pretty much interconnected in their goal to build high-quality, accurate wristwatches. In 1910 and 1914, Rolex received two certificates that solidified them among one of the best watchmakers. The first is the Swiss Certificate of Chronometric Precision and the second for Class A Precision, which was the first time that either of these awards were given to a wristwatch. Soon, British taxes increased on imported gold and silver, pushing Wilsdorf to move the entire Rolex company to Geneva, Switzerland in 1919. At the same time, Wilsford bought out Alfred Davis and became the sole owner of Rolex. Now, at this point, it was pretty clear that Rolex was already on their way to becoming a great brand, but two game-changing innovations accelerated them to the top. On July 29, 1926, after 21 years of watchmaking, they patented their first water and dustproof watch case, which they coined the Oyster. Now, this was significant for a lot of reasons, but the main being that it made wristwatches practical for everyday use without the constant fear of them breaking. One thing that I want to note is that it's important to realize that the term waterproof wasn't tossed around in 1926 like it is today. Overall, there just wasn't a lot of confidence in the ability to make a watch waterproof, but Hans Wilsdorf was so confident in his creation that he put it all on the line when he put a Rolex Oyster on Mercedes Gleets, a famous swimmer, as she attempted to swim the English Channel. By the end of the journey, the watch was still performing perfectly, and the skepticism among its ability really diminished. A second breakthrough came just five years later in 1931 with the creation of the self-winding wrist the self-winding wrist watch. Self-winding self wristwatch, self-winding wristwatch, self- Before then, each watch had to be manually wound to keep the gears turning and the time accurate. Rolex's new perpetual or never-ending movement allowed the watch to continue running just on the energy created while being worn. The actual mechanics are extremely complex and it's really seen as a true work of art that's now a part of every modern automatic watch. Hans Wilsdorf has built Rolex into one of the world's most prestigious brands that stands as a symbol of wealth and success. With the entry-level Rolex starting around $8,000 and the most expensive being sold for over eight figures and over a million units produced every year, it's not an easy sell. Their strategy was to position the Rolex brand alongside the most daring individuals in art, adventure, and sports. The first time they did this was in 1927, which I spoke about earlier when they put the Rolex Oyster on Mercedes Gleets as she swam across the English Channel. However, the real marketing began after the event when Rolex bought the front page of the Daily Mail to advertise the success of the watch. While it might sound normal today, this was actually the first time a company had successfully used a celebrity endorsement and it pretty much opened up a new sector of marketing. And they didn't stop there. In 1935, one of the world's fastest drivers, Sir Malcolm Campbell, set the land speed record at over 300 miles an hour wearing a Rolex. In 1953, Sir Edmund Hillary climbed Mount Everest wearing a Rolex, and the list goes on and on. Each of these events resulted in celebrities endorsing the Rolex brand to their fans in their own words, pretty much forcing people to associate Rolex with high status. Over the course of the last century, watches have really transitioned from being a useful tool to becoming a fashion statement and an accessory, with people collecting millions of dollars worth of them. Now, for watch companies, that meant a big marketing transition, which, of course, Rolex did in fashion. 
After proving to the world that their watches were able to endure intense conditions, they moved away from speaking about their features and mechanical improvements. Seeing the success that they were having with sponsoring individuals, Rolex decided to step it up a notch and sponsor whole events in the sports and arts world. Today, Rolex is linked to more than 100 major international events, including Formula One, the Wimbledon, and the Oscars, and have over 140 testimonies from industries including tennis legend Roger Federer, marine biologist Sylvia Earle, and filmmaker Martin Scorsese. The ability of Rolex to sell a dream and a life style as opposed to a product was and still is among the best. It was a new concept when they started it, but now it's pretty much been adopted by every luxury company. Rolex has also taken this strategy to social media. They joined later than some brands uploading their first YouTube video in 2012. They're now on eight platforms and it's pretty much the most apparent place to see their change in advertising. They went from using terms and slogans such as the world's first waterproof watch to a crown for every achievement. Once again, connecting Rolex to monumental events in the world and to their customers' everyday lives. Another marketing strategy taken up by Rolex is not meeting their customers' demand. They have a limited number of authorized dealers and make it relatively easy to get an entry-level Rolex watch. However, they've limited production of their high-end watches, which has created an artificial exclusivity factor. The result has been customers on wait lists for certain models, sometimes spanning the course of years. Hans Wilsdorf's wife passed away in 1945, which led him to create the Hans Wilsdorf Foundation. He had no heirs and all the shares of the company were then moved into the foundation. The trust described how Rolex should be run after his death and ensured that they would never merge with another company, be sold, or be publicly traded. And this is really the reason that Rolex is able to run the way that they do today. They have no shareholders to appease, so they can take their time and take greater risks for greater rewards. After building Rolex into what it is today, Hans Wilsdorf passed away on July 6, 1960.